Wow, well, this is good. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, no, I, I, th I think it, 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 it's great that the, this area sponsors the, the book festival and does such an amazing job. We, um, we uh, went back and forth trying to uh, have me come to that, and, and eventually, uh, by, by the time it worked out, I was kind of booked for, the, for those dates. So it was so great that the schools and, and the Nina Library could put together um, this program. Um, I visit schools all the time, and I think one of the reasons why I get picked to do that is uh, I wrote my first book in school. It was, it was actually, um, do you know that I wrote my first book when I was in seventh grade? Did you ever hear that? I was 12, 36 years ago, and um, it was really almost a mistake. In my middle school, totally true, the track and field coach had to teach English because they ran out of English teachers and they had extra track and field coaches. Guess whose class got picked to have track and field man? Us. A, a nice guy, good teacher, but at the time, he had never taught, you know, English language arts in his life. So when it came to writing, he just sort of didn't know what to tell us to do. And he, he drew a blank. He, he stood there saying, okay, uh, work on whatever you want for the rest of the year. <laughs> and uh, it was February. So from February to June, we had a class period every single day to write one Thing. And, and, and I got into it and I started taking it home and, and working on it at night. And, and that's how I wrote my, my very first book, which was called This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall. Yeah, oh, you know what grade I got on This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall? B plus. How lame is that? They, they gave me A plus, but they deducted one grade for uh, messiness. But, um, <laughs> you know, I got it published. Um, do you guys get scholastic book orders? So I was the class monitor for book orders in, in seventh grade, and I just mailed it to the address on the book order sheets, right, the form. You, you're kind of looking at me like, that works? <laughs> well, you, you got to get lucky, and, and, and I did. I mean, everything about this was, um, was, was fluky, you, you know. Um, I, I, when I when I received my um, my B plus, I was I was not that inspired to take my book further. But actually, it was my seventh grade English teacher who kind of inspired me. He didn't say publish your book. He actually wanted to laminate it, and <laughs> put it in the library. It's a very teacher thing to want to do, laminating stuff. Uh, my wife is a teacher, and she is an absolutely compulsive laminator. Um, I, I fully expect to come home from one of these trips and find like the couch laminated because um, <laughs> she used to teach third grade and third grade is the year where if it's not laminated, it's, it's kind of shredded. Now, now when I speak at colleges and the undergrads come up to me and they say, well, how do I know if teaching is the right career for me? I'll sort of say, ask yourself one simple question. Do I feel the need to laminate absolutely <laughs> everything? That's, on the table in, in front of me. So, you know, when he said laminate it and put it in the library, he was actually saying to me, what you have written is good enough for other people to read. And, and that's why I did send the, the book in to um, Scholastic. And, and I remember, um, you know, just mailing it to the address on, on, on the book order sheets. And, and, you know, for a few months I heard nothing, which, you know, when you're in seventh grade, like, if you hear nothing for four months, that's kind of a long time, you know. I kind of wrote off my submission after a few days. And then this letter showed up that was very mellow, you know, like, yeah, we might even maybe possibly consider publishing it. Well, this is what's known in the book business as an extremely enthusiastic response. And a few days after my 13th birthday, I was in eighth grade, I signed a contract for my, my very first book. Now, I was, I was, well, 13 and 14 when it came out. I'm 48, right? So, so this is a very, very long time ago. Uh, and that book, over the years, has been in French, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Italian, Korean, Dutch, and Greek. Isn't that wild to see your seventh grade project in Portuguese and... Korean. I, I love looking at my books in, in other languages. Um, you know, uh, if, if you know the old McDonald Hall books, it, it's a school, and the principal is a man named Mr. Sturgeon, and his nickname behind his back, they call him the fish. In French, he becomes Monsieur Sturgeon, and his nickname becomes Caviar. 
um, which is, you know, not really a translation. But, but some things don't translate at all. You know, I have a book called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. And when that book was done in French, well, how do you translate a title like that that's just an idiomatic expression, right? Um, expressions don't translate. My translator told me to put liar, liar, pants on fire, literally, word for word, into French. It would be like calling a book, teller of untruths, your trousers have combusted. <laughs> um, it sort of blew my mind a little bit, but I... Um, I knew this guy who worked for Pepsi, and, and he was like, ah, oh, that's, that's nothing. Remember a few years back, they had a Pepsi ad, and the big slogan was, come alive with the Pepsi generation. And supposedly, when they translated that into Chinese, it actually turned out to say, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> so um, I don't feel so bad about my little... Liar, liar, pants on fire. But um, I see you have some 39 Clues fans in, in, in the room. Um, so 39 Clues is a multi-author series. Uh, and I'm one of seven authors writing 39 Clues. I'm the author of book two, book eight, co-author of 11. And now there's a new series out called The 39 Clues, Cahills versus Vespers. And I'm the author of uh, book one of that, which is called The Medusa Plot. So every 39 Clues book takes place in a different part of the world. And, and uh, book eight, The Emperor's Code, one of mine, is China. And there's a character in the series named Jonah Wizard, who is, um, he's almost like a celebrity, right? I mean, he's a rapper and he has his own reality TV show, calls himself The Wiz. So his big slogan is, live large with the whiz generation. But they have to translate it for the, the Chinese tour. And it actually turns out to mean, Jonah wizard makes your ancestors fat, right? <laughs> well, if you, can, if you can end up with teller of untruths, your trousers have combusted, you know, is it really so weird to, you know, to think that, that live large could sort of get misconstrued in, in translation like that. Um, you know, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't leave the title. So uh, when they translated it, they called it Super Monteuse, which really just means super liar. Um, I don't love the title, but, but what are you going to do? It's a little bit autobiographical, uh, not that I'm a liar, but as a kid. I was kind of the world's greatest maker of excuses. But as I told my, my, um, my school groups today, um, I am not, excuse me, I'm just going to pop this water. Um, I am not a really autobiographical writer. And I've never been good at it. I mean, even in elementary school, if a teacher said, right from experience, I'd end up with my dinner at grandma's. You, you know, I, I really had trouble finding, maybe it's just my life is not super exciting, so I, I prefer to make stuff up. Um, I do write from real life, but it tends to be more things that I notice. I, I wrote a book called The Chicken Doesn't Skate, and um, it really started with a school visit, and the principal was giving me a tour of the school, and um, we walked past the science lab, and when I looked in, I saw that the floor was covered in straw, <laughs> which, which in and of itself was worth a second look. And in the middle of the room, there was a chicken. Right? So I turned to the principal and said what you would say, right? which is, what's up with the chicken? And, uh, and he explained that it's a school project. Right? They took a baby chick, just hatched from an egg, and they raised it in class. And it actually only takes about four months for a chicken to go from unhatched egg to fully grown adult hen. And then the plan was, when the chicken was fully grown, they were going to kill it, cook it, and eat it. Now, I'm not saying the teacher whips out an ax one day and starts chasing this, this chicken around the lab, but they were really going to do it. Um, when, when the time came, they were going to send the chicken to a butcher, he does the deed, it, it comes back cutlets, and every kid in that class who helped raise the chicken would get a couple of bites of their chicken. 
Um, and, you know, as a, as a writer, I just sort of stood there saying, I've got to write a book about this, right? Because I mean, if you put an animal in a classroom for, for four months, it's not the class experiment, it's the class pet, right? And nobody wants their class pet to be a McNugget in training. Um, <laughs> And I just knew that, that when they realized that their, their class pet was lunch, you know, it, it was going to be nuts. Um, because I feel like writers are observers. You know, my, my favorite TV show um, in reruns is Seinfeld. And, and, and one of the things I love about the show Seinfeld is it, he's such a good observer, right? If you ever listen to his little comedy routines, they're basically observations. They always start off with, did you ever notice that? And I think that to be a writer, you have to ask yourself, what are the did you ever notices of my own life? I, I wrote a book uh, called No More Dead Dogs, which is really not about dead dogs. And um, the did you ever notice was just, did you ever notice in school Whenever your class does a novel study on like a classic award-winning book about a dog, the dog always dies at the end, <laughs> right? Try this experiment. Next time you, you, you know, you're in the library, uh, find a book with an award sticker and a dog on the cover, right? <laughs> Trust me, that dog is going down, right? <laughs> Now, I've written lots of books with dogs on the cover, but we don't have, the, it's the award sticker that, that kind of puts it over the top. Um, old Yeller, what happens? A dog dies. You know, Sounder, dog dies. Uh, dog and Stone Fox, dies. You, you know, where the red fern grows, right? The dog dies, then like three pages later, the other dog dies. <laughs> it's kind of the double whammy of, of dead dog books. Have you ever read Love That Dog? It's a great book, but the dog is dead before the book even starts. Right? It's almost like a pre-dead dog book. Um, don't even get me started on Marley. So No More Dead Dogs isn't about dead dogs. It's about these books where the dog dies. And you can almost, excuse me, picture, um, you can almost picture your, your comedy, you know, your comedy routine, your did you ever notice kind of, uh, kind of thing.